Chair, one announcement we get is to encourage you to get in your nominations for elders and deacons. This is the time of year in which we do that. The ballots have been sent out. You can fill them out. Drop them in the box that's on the table over here in the commons. That's where you can uh, leave your nominations. Get them in by October 19, please. You can also drop them off at the office if you choose to do it that way. But we ask that you get them in by the 19th. Prayerfully consider that and ask for the Holy Spirit's guidance in nominating new elders and deacons for the next term in 2021. So a while back, I read an article about the purpose of our singing and what it does. One of the things the singing of God's people does, the praises of God's people does, is it chases away the devil. Satan cannot stand, cannot stand people praising God and lifting up his name. And so one of the reasons why we sing is so that Satan has no power among us, so that his presence isn't here, and that we can lift up the name of Jesus and the Spirit can work among us. And so let's lift up our praise this morning. That's what this first song talks about. I raise a hallelujah, and it drives away all our enemies. So let's stand and sing this praise.
your Dwell at Home Faith Formation Program. We as families will be celebrating an early Christmas. That's right. We're going to be discussing the birth of the baby Jesus. Over the centuries, as the gospel has been revealed to us, we have come to realize that as Christians, our main purpose for living is to glorify God and spread the news about Jesus far and wide. Today, we're also going to see how Paul and Barnabas did just that. Let's sing about it now. Go tell it on the mountain. Thank you. 
Oh, Father, how good it is to be in this place today, singing your praises, inviting the presence of your Spirit to be here among us, chasing away the forces of darkness and Satan and his, his demons, Father, that seek to undermine and discourage us. Father, your angels and you are much stronger. You have defeated him. You have defeated death. We live in the hope of eternal life. We live in the joy of sins forgiven. So when he comes to accuse and, and discourage and undermine, we can speak your truth to him. We can declare who we are in Jesus. And we can know the joy and the hope of the victory that he has won. And we can let our praises ring. We can find our strength and our hope in you. What glorious good news we have. And we celebrate that today. Father, we're so glad to be together as your people. We're glad and give you thanks for all the many blessings that you give us. Father, you are so good to us. Every single day we experience your grace, your goodness. Even in these crazy times, we know that you are in control and that you love every single one of us. No matter what we're facing, no matter what the struggle, you are with us. Doesn't mean that everything's going to be easy. In fact, Jesus promised that there would be hard things, that there would be suffering as we follow you. But in that, we will experience you. We will find you. We will know you and come to understand you more deeply and, and understand your presence and your power and your strength in deeper, more powerful ways in our lives. So bless us as we deal with, with the, the challenges of life. And we want to hold up before you, Father, today people from Bethel that are dealing with particular challenges. We continue to pray for Belva. We thank you, Father, that, that things that she's been feeling better, and we pray tomorrow that she uh, has some lab tests that those results will be, will be good for her, and she'll be able to take another round of chemo treatment. And we pray, Father, that you will bless Belva with strength and healing. We plead with you for her healing. And we ask that things will be able to progress as they need to for her be a work in her body and also work in her spirit to strengthen and encourage her. We thank you for the good progress that Jim Baruch has been making, that uh, things are just looking much better for him. Continue to strengthen his lungs, Father, enable him to return home soon. What a joyous thing that will be. We pray for Ada too, Father. We pray that you will heal her from COVID-19, that you'll protect her lungs and strengthen her breathing, that you'll be present with her as she's in the hospital. One of the hard things about all of this is that you just can't have visitors during this time. We pray that she will sense your presence with her in a very real and powerful way. We pray the same thing, Father, for those who are in nursing homes and who cannot see visitors, who can't get out. We think of Egbert, we think of Grace, we think of Clarice, we think of Henrietta. We think of others who just haven't been able to get out and be in the world like, like Dorothy Merrill and Dorothy Father and Jean Miller, we pray for your grace to be given to them. And uh, in this time, we will know your presence, the power of your spirit, caring for us and being with us. We pray for the families as well. And Father, we pray for Dan Van Gorp as he anticipates the surgery that he was supposed to have this past week. It's been a hard week with delay and continuing to deal with the pain. We pray that all will go smooth rest well so that he can have the surgery that he needs this, this coming Tuesday. We lift him up before you and Sherry as well. Father, we pray for our nation. This is an interesting and turbulent and, and a time that distresses many hearts. We call upon you to bless our land. We call upon you to show mercy to our country. We should call upon you to, to bless and care for our leaders and cause them to seek you we ask that hearts in this country will turn to you, that we will find, that we will, that the spirit will move in this land and call people back to you. We pray this earnestly, Father, on behalf of our nation. We ask that you will guide all the events of these coming weeks by your powerful, sovereign hand. We pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. The, uh, the praise team is going to bless us beautiful song. Jody, you're going to talk about some things here. I'll get out of the way. 
Um, as many of you and myself are living in this crazy, weird time, we go through a lot of ups and downs. Um, just wondering why this is happening, will it ever end? Uh, you know, just wondering what in the world is ever going to come of this crazy situation that we're in. And this past week, as I uh, was preparing for worship, I came to discover that the serenity prayer, which many of us are very familiar with because um, it was adapted by um, the 12 step program in AA, um, actually has a longer version that I never knew about. And I found it this week and I discovered that the longer version um, just really speaks to my heart, especially the last half. And um, so we wanted to read it together today. So I'm just praying that this timeless prayer will speak afresh to you and bring you peace as it has brought me peace. Go ahead, Ken. Pray with us. God, give us grace to accept with serenity the things that cannot be changed. Courage to change the things which should be changed, and the wisdom to distinguish the one from the other. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship as a pathway to peace, taking as Jesus did this sinful world as it is, not as I would have it, Trusting that you will make all things right if I surrender to your will, so that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you forever in the next. Amen. I count on one thing the same God.
this reminder of your faithfulness. That you are the God that never changes. You are the God who is always with us, even in the lowest valleys, even in the hardest times. You are with us. You are present, and you are working. And Father, we pray that you will help us and encourage us with that truth and that promise, so that in those times, rather than despairing, rather than being discouraged and giving up, being hopeless, we can place our hope in you. We can find in you our strength. We can lift your name up in praise and drive away Satan and his efforts to discourage us and cause us to be hopeless. And that we can continue strong in you, no matter how hard it gets, we can be who you called us to be in Christ. Speak to us now in your word. We pray that you will open our hearts to, to see that truth in the lives of Paul and Barnabas and to see how, that, how we, too, are called to live life with that kind of hope and courage. Bless the words that we read, words that are spoken. Fill this time with your spirit, we pray. In the name of Jesus. So today, as we continue our journey in the book of Acts, we're going to stay with Paul and Barnabas on their first missionary journey. Last week we were with them in the, in the city of Pisidian Antioch, and there we looked at the first sermon of Paul that is recorded in the book of Acts. He preached it in the Jewish synagogue there in Antioch, and the climax of that sermon was when Paul told his listeners how they could be made right with the God of the universe, the God who is the source of all reality. Everything in creation and every person exists because of him. He is in control. He is the ultimate authority, and he is actively at work in all of history. And he has made a way for people to be justified made right with him and have an eternal relationship with him. That's the climax of Paul's message. And, that, and he tells the people that through faith in Jesus, their sins can be forgiven and they can have eternal life. It's the gospel. And Luke tells us in Acts chapter 14, 13 that the people who heard Paul's message were captivated by it. Both Jews and devout converts to Judaism, Jews and Gentiles, continued to talk with Paul and Barnabas after the, after the service that day in the synagogue, and they were invited to speak again on the next Sabbath. In Acts chapter 13, verse 44, Luke tells us, on the next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. They're invited back, and the word is spread about this, this thing that this guy is talking about, and the whole city, almost the whole city, comes to hear the word of the Lord. The Holy Spirit was with them. There was huge interest in what they were saying. But that didn't sit well with some people. Luke goes on to say, when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and talked abusively against what Paul was saying. So here we see the first instance of what is going to become a recurring theme during Paul's missionary work. The Jewish leaders became jealous and they came against Paul. They see their power and their influence suddenly slipping away. For their whole lives and really throughout the whole history of the Jewish nation, they have seen themselves as set apart and special. They were the ones who had exclusive access to the God, the one true God of the universe. It was them. They were his chosen people. They were set apart for a special relationship with the one true God. And, and yes, others could be a part of that relationship, but they had to convert, do so by converting to Judaism, the Jewish faith. These guys had special status. They controlled the access. And now, this message that Paul was proclaiming said that anyone could have access to the one true God. And it wasn't through the Jewish leaders and their laws and traditions. The access was through Jesus. And all of a sudden, these guys weren't so important. All of a 
a sudden, they were like everyone else. Or, or to put it another way, everyone could be like them. And they don't like it. And they respond, they respond like all of us, as sinful human beings do when we feel like our influence or our importance or our control or our power is threatened. They resist. They fight against Paul and they try to hang on to what they have. And the truth, the truth of what Paul is saying doesn't matter to them. It doesn't matter that the message is true to scripture and it's about God's ultimate act in all of history. It doesn't matter that, that this is the fulfillment of God's ultimate purpose of bringing people from every nation and every tribe into his kingdom. It doesn't matter. All that they see is what is important to them, and it is not what God is doing. That's not what is important to them. What's important to them is their own influence, their own power, their own control. And that is such a human response, isn't it? I mean, it is, it is easy to be judgmental of these Jews, but we all tend to react the same way. When God changes things up, and things in our lives start going in a direction that we don't expect or that we don't want, we resist. We fight against it. We try to take or we try to keep control. And when God may be bringing about his purposes in ways that stretch us and challenge our expectations, we fight it. Instead of opening ourselves up to what he may be doing, we try to have it our way. Or we try to keep it our way. And we all do it. I know I definitely do. We all do that. And that's what these Jews are doing. But that doesn't stop what God intends to do. It doesn't stop what God is doing here. Luke tells us in verse 46, then Paul and Barnabas answered them boldly. So they're resisting, they're speaking abusively against them and all that. But Paul and Barnabas said, we had to speak the word of God to you first, since you reject it and do not consider yourselves worthy of eternal life by your resistance and all that. We now turn to the Gentiles. For this is what the Lord has commanded us. I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. When the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and honored the word of the Lord. And all who were appointed for eternal life believed. So these Jews can't stop what God is doing. Even though they're resisting, even though they're fighting against it, God is going to do what he's going to do. And these Gentiles were glad to hear the word of the Lord and accept it. And, and, and following this, Luke tells us that the word of God spread through the whole region. But the Jews kept working against Paul and Barnabas. And they stirred up some prominent and influential men and women in, the, in Antioch. And they started to bring persecution against Paul and Barnabas. And finally, they officially just expelled them from the region. But despite this, Luke says that God was growing a joyful, Holy Spirit-filled group of disciples in Antioch. He says at the end of, of, uh, of chapter 13 that the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. So God keeps moving. It's despite the resistance. And so from Antioch, after they're expelled from that region... Paul and Barnabas traveled a little over 100 miles. Here's where they were. And they traveled to the town of Iconium right here. This is uh, the missionary journey that we started over here in this Antioch. Went over to Cyprus, up here to Perga, up here to Pisidian Antioch, in the region of Pisidia. And now they come over here to Iconium. That's a little over 100 miles. You like how shaky my light is? <laughs> I can't hold that thing still. Uh, oh, Tony said that to me the other day. Your light is pretty shaky. I can't help it. <laughs> but they come to Iconium, and it's a little over 100 miles from Antioch. And that's where they, uh, that's where they start to, to also preach the gospel. And Luke continues the story for us in Acts chapter 14. And Luke tells us that a great number of people believed in this region of Iconium, both Jews and Gentiles, but once again, the Jews who refused to believe stirred up trouble. 
and they got a number of Gentiles to go along with them. But Paul and Barnabas hung in there. Luke says in verse 3 of chapter 14, So Paul and Barnabas spent considerable time there, speaking boldly for the Lord, who confirmed the message of his grace by enabling them to do miraculous signs and wonders. Now, in the face of the resistance they were experiencing, God helped them by enabling them to do miracles. Even though the Jews were trying to tell the people that their message was a lie, these men aren't from God, this is a, not true, this is a lie, the Jews were trying to say that, but the miracles that God enabled them to do confirmed the truth that their message was of God. But still, the Jews resisted. Still, they came against them. And this time, instead of just trying to get them out of the area, smelling them, they ratcheted things up. Luke tells us in verse 5, there was a plot afoot among the Gentiles and Jews together with their leaders to mistreat them and stone them. Now they were actually plotting to kill Paul and Barnabas. The resistance and persecution is ratcheting up. Things are getting even harder. Paul and Barnabas learn of that plot to stone them and they get out of town. And they went about 20 miles away over here to Lystra, the town of Lystra. It says they went to the region of, of Lystra and Derby. It's about 60 miles apart, only about 20 miles here between Iconium and Lystra. And they head over there where they see things get even tougher. Verse 8 of Luke chapter, or Acts chapter 14. In Lystra, there sat a man crippled in his feet, who was lame from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul as he was speaking. Paul looked directly at him and saw that he had faith to be healed and called out, stand up on your feet. At that, the man jumped up and began to walk. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they shouted in the Lyconian language, the gods have come down to us in human form. Barnabas they called Zeus and Paul they called Hermes because he was the chief speaker. The priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought bulls and reeds to the city gates because he and the crowd wanted to offer sacrifices to them. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of this, they tore their clothes and rushed out into the crowd shouting, Men, why are you doing this? We too are only men, a human like you. We are bringing you good news, telling you to turn from these worthless things to the living God who made heaven and earth and sea and everything in them. In the past, he let all nations go their own way, yet he has not left himself without testimony. He has shown kindness by giving you rain from heaven and crops in their seasons. He provides you with plenty of food and fills your hearts with joy. Even th with these words, they had difficulty keeping the crowd from sacrificing to them. Then some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and won the crowd over. They stoned Paul and dragged him outside the city, thinking he was dead. But after the disciples had gathered around him, he got up and went back into the city. The next day, he and Barnabas left for Derby. So this scene in Lystra is kind of the climax of Luke's narrative of Paul's first missionary journey. This is kind of where things all escalate to a head. And in this story, we see incredibly different responses to Paul and Barnabas. We see them being hugely popular and adored. And we see them vilely hated and abused. And we see how neither one of these reactions changes who they are or their commitment to God and mission that he's called them to. So first of all, we see this incredible scene unfold as Paul is teaching. As Luke tells us earlier, God enabled Paul and Barnabas to do miraculous signs to confirm the message of grace they preach. And here is one of those instances where that happens. As Paul is speaking, this disabled man catches his eye, and Paul sees something. He sees the, the Holy Spirit filling this man with faith. This man is hearing the message of God's grace, and he believes. 
By the power of the Holy Spirit, he believes Jesus can set him free from his sins and make him right with God. That's the central message of the gospel. He believes that God will give him the extraordinary gift of forgiveness of his sins and eternal life and, be, and, and enable him to be his child through faith in Jesus. And as the Holy Spirit is stirring that faith in him, in the gospel, the Holy Spirit also gives him a sense that God intends to do something else for him as well. And the Holy Spirit reveals the same thing to Paul. So when Paul looks at him, he, see, he realizes that God intends to do another message-confirming miracle right here, right now. And he tells him to stand up. Stand up at this man who had never walked in his life, jumps to his feet, and starts to walk. And naturally, the people are astounded. They are shocked. They're astounded. He's never walked in his life from birth. He's been lame. And now they see him walking, and they're astounded, and they start shouting and celebrating. This is incredible. But in their ignorance, they see this miracle through the lens of their own religion. They think Paul and Barnabas are the Greek gods Zeus and Hermes appearing here in human form. And they start shouting about it in, their, in the Lyconian language. They're shouting in the Lyconian language. So Paul and Barnabas probably had no idea what they were saying. They didn't speak Lyconian. All they saw and, saw and heard was this incredible joy and excitement. And it had to feel pretty good. Paul and Barnabas, especially after all the resistance and hostility that they had been dealing with in Antioch and Iconium. And, and so this has got to be oh, This is great. This is awesome. But when the priest of Zeus shows up with the sacrifices, they realize what's going on. And it horrifies them. They tear their clothes, which is how the Jewish people responded to awful things like the possibility of, of the blasphemy that this would be. They were appalled that they might be worshipped as gods. Only God deserves to be worshipped. He, not they, were the ones who did this miracle. And so they rush out into the crowd telling the people that they're not gods at all. We're human just like you. But then notice that they don't just try to get the people to settle down and stop what they're doing. They take it a step further and now risk offending and angering these people who are in the middle of absolutely adoring them. They tell them to turn from these worthless things to the living God. Basically, they're saying gods like Zeus and Hermes are no gods at all. They're worthless. These people have a temple to Zeus right outside their city. He's the chief god in the Greek pantheon of gods. And Paul and Barnabas are saying, he's nothing. He's worthless. Zeus isn't the source of heaven and earth and sea and everything in them. He's not the one who supplies the rain and makes the crops grow and provides food. That <laughs> provides their food. He's not the one who is in control of the nations of the earth. The source of everything is the living God who Paul and Barnabas have come to proclaim. He's the true God you should worship. Zeus and Hermes are nothing. They are worthless. Can you imagine how offensive this must have been to these people? Even though Paul and Barnabas were actually bringing them good news about how they could be made right with the one true God and receive eternal life, this message about their own gods was not going to be popular. It was not going to be well received. And yet, Paul and Barnabas chose to speak. In fact, they were passionate to speak. They didn't just try to keep these people happy or liking them. They didn't try to hang on to their newfound popularity and status. They spoke the truth. And they stayed true to God in their mission. They knew who they were. They knew who God is. And they knew who they were in God. And the opinions and the feelings of these people did not change that. 
They stayed true to God and to the truth of the gospel they came to share. And they wanted these people to know the truth. That is far more important than the celebrity status they suddenly had. Wow, they pay a price. Luke says that Jews from Iconium and Antioch showed up and won the crowd over. Some of these Jews had traveled well over a hundred miles to track down Paul and Barnabas. And really, they were after them because of Paul and Barnabas Barnabas spoke the truth to them as well. Unlike the people of Lystra, they did believe in the one true God, but they didn't like the truth about him that Paul and Barnabas had been preaching. They didn't like it that Gentiles could also be people of God simply through faith in Jesus. And the message that Paul and Barnabas preached offended and angered them as well. But that couldn't make Paul and Barnabas change their message with them either. They didn't back off. They didn't change their approach. They didn't say, okay, we'll, we'll just keep it with, between you Jews and us. They shared Jesus with everyone they could. Jew and Gentile because that's what God wanted them to do. Even though it meant hostility and persecution, they stayed true to God and true to their mission. And just like that, just like that, they go from being the hottest celebrities in Lystra to being treated like the worst criminals. We don't know what these Jews said to win the crowd over, but whatever it was, it turned everyone against them. And now what had only been a plot, a plot to stone them, turns into a reality. Paul is stoned by the people. Stoning is meant to put someone to death. And it appears, and it appears that's the outcome for Paul. He's dragged outside the city and left for dead. Probably was. But somehow, miraculously, he gets up. He gets up. Not only does he get up, he goes back into the city. I don't know about you, but that is the last thing I would have done, is to go back into that city. But that's what he does. He goes back into the city and the next day, he and Barnabas go to Derby, about 60 miles away, as I said. And Luke tells us that they preached the good news there and won large numbers of disciples there as well. They keep doing exactly what they had been doing. Not only that, look what Luke tells us they did after that. Verse 21. Then they returned. They returned to Lystra, Iconium and Antioch. They returned, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. They went back to these cities where they had been persecuted, harassed, and nearly killed. And look what they said to the believers. Verse 23. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, they said. <coughs> They didn't go back, tell the disciples, be careful now. Watch out. These guys are getting nasty in here. They didn't tell them that. They didn't tell them to hold back with the truth so that people like the Jews or the worshipers of Zeus would like them and not be offended and angry. No. They said it's going to be hard. In fact, as we followed this first journey of Paul and Barnabas, it didn't get easier for them. It got harder and harder. But they didn't quit. They didn't change who they were, and they didn't change the message they proclaimed. They knew who they were in God, and they stayed true to him and to the mission that he gave them, even, even when people hated them, and it got brutally hard. They put their lives in God's hands and trusted in his promised goodness and faithfulness. And I pray that you and I can do the same thing. You know, there's things that are going on in our world right now where it feels like it, it gets harder. And we, we can, I've heard people talk about Christians need to be prepared. Things can, might really be getting hard. 
in this nation that we think has been so easy. And we're all dealing with things in our own lives where things sometimes just get really hard. That doesn't change who we are to God. It doesn't change who He is. And it doesn't change what He's called us all to do. Follow Him and share it with others. I pray that we can follow all of our examples for our own lives and as a church. Let's pray together. God, this is an amazing story. Yet Paul and Barnabas, as they said to the Lyconians, we're men just like you. We are human just like you. They were human just like us. By the power of your Holy Spirit, you enabled them to do what we just read about, reflect them. Help us to do the same. We can't do it in our own strength. We ask that you will, by the power of your spirit, help us to be true to you, true to who we are in you, and true to the gospel, true to the life that you call us to, true to your principles, true to your will. We ask you to do that in us and through us. Help us not be concerned with what people think of us. Help us not to seek popularity, set aside principles and standards for that. Help us not to be fearful of, of anger or criticism, set aside our principles because of that. We ask you to help us to be true to you. Help us to understand that your opinion is the only one that matters, not the opinions of people. We want to live out the lives that you call us to in our world. We want to lay down our lives for the sake of your truth and gospel. And we trust in your goodness and your faithfulness to us. And you will always be present. You have promised that over and over in your world. We trust in your goodness. Thank you. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. Let's stand. Sing this great song. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. Oh,
good to have you all here this morning. Just a reminder, take your time as you're exiting to allow some spacing. We brought a, uh, a mask for visiting and stuff. We encourage that. Spread out through the commons to visit and hang out. We ask that you not gather right outside the auditorium doors so we avoid uh, kind of crowding there. Uh, but do hang out and visit with each other. Uh, there's plenty of space to spread out and do that, connect with each other. We need that in these days. Also a reminder that your tithes and offerings can be received as you exit the auditorium today. There's plates there for you to place your tithes and offerings in. Thank you for your continued faithful support of Bethel. You can drop your, your tithes and offerings off at the Bethel North office as well or send them in or use the Tithely app on your phone for online giving. Lots of ways to continue to uh, help Bethel meet its obligations and support the ministry that God has called us to in Sheldon during this time. So as you go forth from this place today, know that the living God who is filled with goodness and his saved, his son, Jesus Christ, go with you. They go before you to show you the way, behind you to encourage you, alongside of you, to be friends, you, above you to watch over you. And Jesus lives inside of you by the power of his Holy Spirit to fill you with his love, his peace, his power. Amen. Amen.